Hi, I'm Sean Kennedy. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Nursing. You're listening to a podcast in our Behind the Article series, which are interviews with authors of AJN articles. You can find all of our podcasts on our website, ajnonline.com, under the Multimedia tab, as well as on iTunes, Spotify, and Google. Our content, including the article we refer to in this podcast, is accessible online on our website, ajnonline.com. You can also find AJN on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on our blog, AJN Off the Charts. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking with Dr. Alexa Colgrove Curtis, who is Assistant Dean of Graduate Nursing and Director of the MPH DNP Dual Degree Program at the University of San Francisco School of Nursing and Health Professions. Dr. Curtis is co author of the article in the February issue, Case Control Studies which she wrote with colleague Courtney Keeler, who is an associate professor also at the University of San Francisco School of Nursing and Health Professions. This is the eighth article in our series, Nursing Research Step-by-Step, which is produced in collaboration with the Heilbrunn Family Center for Research Nursing at Rockefeller University in New York City. The series is designed to give clinical nurses the knowledge and skills they need to evaluate and participate in research step-by-step. Each column that we do represent pre- presents a different research concept or method from research design to data interpretation. And the column appears every other month in AJN. You can find all the columns under our collections tab in the uh, on our website. The prior column in the December issue was on cohort studies, which is one type of observational studies. This column in the February issue focuses on another type that looks at associations between exposures and outcomes. So Alexa, welcome. Uh, And I hope my explanation of case control studies looking at associations and outcomes is accurate. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I um, am delighted to be here uh, speaking about these articles and have just really enjoyed being part of this team that is putting together um, the research step-by-step series. Um, I just take this opportunity to really do a shout out for working in teams of colleagues and working <laughs> yes. in interprofessional teams of colleagues. And just um, for your readers to know that when we put together these columns, we are bouncing our ideas back and forth between all of the co-authors, but also we submit these articles and they go Uh, They are reviewed extensively by the reviewers at AJN who provide invaluable feedback and the opportunity to develop the articles further. So it's just been a delight working with you all. Well, thank you. And it's been it's been great. Um, You folks have just been so uh, dependable and reliable and on time and on deadline, which uh, editors highly prize in authors and and column uh, coordinators. So thank you for that. Um, And the article has been very well received. We we know that people are uh, using it in um, uh, their graduate programs. And uh, we know from some of our uh, colleagues on the Ovid uh, database, which is a a, a division of Walters Kluwer Health, uh, AJN's publisher, that it's one of the highly um, viewed articles on the database, the the whole series is. So uh, people are I think liking the fact that it's step by step and, you know, it's one thing they can concentrate on. And I do have to say, as a non-researcher, um, I found the articles so helpful. I mean, I took my research course during my graduate degree, but um, what I find so helpful and I think clinical nurses really relate to is that you use real life examples and, and uh, make make the research methodology um, understandable by giving the clinical examples of when one might use it. So uh, so really, it's been a great series, and, and we're, we're so glad you guys have done it for us. Well, um, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Go I, ahead. I would say thank you for that. And I, I have also been contacted by organizations, um, hospitals, who, for their research groups, to, and they say that they've been using the columns for their um, you know, their research meetings to work on their own methodology. So that's been great. And and I think in terms of being accessible, it is really helpful that, you know, the authors actively teach this material with graduate nursing students. So we're used to the kind of questions that come up. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so one of the things that um, uh, I wanted to ask you about, because I have to confess that I, I've always found it easy to confuse cohort versus case control studies. 
could you briefly describe for the listeners the uh, the two types and when you would use one versus the other? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so I thought you did a great job of describing <laughs> cohort and case control studies. I thought, okay, so my job's over. Um, you know, they are both um, observation of studies that um, are looking for associations between a health outcome and an exposure. So this article, the current article in the February edition builds on the previous article in the December edition on cohort studies. Cohort studies, um, the difference between the two is cohort studies take a group of people and follow them um, in terms of exposure and look at health outcomes. So that was the December article. And then the February article is the um, the case control um, uh, methodology where you take what we call cases, which are diseases or health outcomes. So people already have the cases and then you look backwards. You look retrospectively into what types of exposures were associated with the cases. Mm. OK. So that so, makes sense. One one is looking forward, you know, the cohort looking, you know, following people along, and the other one is you start with people with cases and look backwards. And so one of the examples that is used in the article is a Danish study on breast cancer um, among clinical nurses. Um, and this so what they started with was breast cancer. Okay, that. Mm -hmm. uh, clinical nurses who ended up with breast cancer, and then they were looking for an exposure. So exposure, I think, is sometimes a funny word for um, for learners and, and methodology because you um, tend to immediately think about an exposure like environmental exposure. Right. Um, and, and, and yes, they use um, cohort and case control studies to explore outcomes of environmental exposures frequently, but exposure can also be, you know, something like, um, you know, any type of predisposing factor. And in, in the, uh, the Hanson Stevens um, uh, research piece that's in the article that exposure they were looking at was shift work, whether, mm -hmm. Um, the difference between, let's say, uh, nurses who worked at nights versus nurses who worked during the daytime. And does the exposure of doing shift work increase the odds? So in case control studies, um, the data is generally analyzed using an odds ratio. Does shift work increase the odds of having breast cancer? So in this in this study, they started with the clinical nurses who um, developed breast cancer, um, and that was defined by the National uh, Breast Cancer Cancer Registry. And then they looked backwards, looked backwards to see what type of work they did in terms of shift work. Now, another way to do that, if we were going to do cohort, we would take a group of, of nurses um, and then follow them for a period of time to see if they developed breast cancer. So so in, in the case control, the exposure is really almost like what variable you're studying. Exactly. And, 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 and you will choose, if you're designing the study, choose the variable based on some type of hypotheses, you know, some type of theoretical foundation that it might be feasible that this, this factor, this variable may um, increase the odds of a certain outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons that I think um, nurses make such great um, researchers in terms of something like a case mm -hmm. control um, study because nurses are experts observe expert observers you know everything I don't know if you experienced this but I I know I remember my nursing professors way way back in my back laureate saying you know after you take this physical assessment course, you will never look at people differently. <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> the same. You know, you'll be sitting on the bus thinking, I wonder. And and I think as nurses, we, we do that. That is so much of what we do as nurses mm -hmm. is watch and, and watch for changes and watch for variations. So nurses are great at saying, hmm, I've noticed this outcome. Right. And yeah, now and, I wonder yeah, I, what. Uh -huh. I was thinking, you know, because nurses 
how nurses in the clinical setting could use this in the sense of saying, gee, I noticed that a lot of the patients who have X seem to also live in this type of condition or also seem to have this. So it's that kind of a uh, of thinking of, you know, seeing trends over the population that come into your uh, setting, whether it's a hospital setting or community health clinic or whatever, that you start to notice those types of things. I think you're absolutely right in terms of that, you know, just that curiosity that nurses, if they're open to it. And of course, I, I always think of they're so busy these days that it's hard to really stop and, and think and have time to really process sometimes. Yeah, I, I agree. And one, you know, I feel like as a nurse, um, that sometimes we undervalue all of the knowledge, all of the, you know, intuition and all of the mm. insight we have and all of the availability to watch and observe. We are the ones, clinical nurses in particular, are the ones who are there watching. And then, and so number one, really recognizing that within yourself is that you know a, a, a lot, you have the opportunity to know a lot about outcomes. And then once you start having that, I notice, mm -hmm. you don't have to do the research alone. That's what we started this conversation with the importance of teams. And mm -hmm. so you notice, and then if you want to explore further and you, you know you probably notice as well as nurses have great hypotheses and are creative thinkers i i notice this outcome and i am thinking it might have an association with this other factor mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then you reach out you go to whatever your resources are you know your hospital research team or a local university research team is that i would like to um, examine a possible association and people will be thrilled. People will be thrilled within any organization, you know, research organization or a hospital organization to, to help develop that team so that you can study that, um, that mm -hmm. interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think the team part is, is, as we started the whole conversation is so important because, um, it's, you know, I, I, I remember conversations where, you know, as a staff nurse, um, it, it was right when they found out that, you know, when you had patients on ventilators on high uh, PEEP, um, that they were all ending up with lung damage. And and, and I remember conversations in the staff uh, lounge where people would say, oh, they, you know, raised the PEEP level to X, Y, Z. And uh, some and somebody would make kind of a, an offhand comment and say, well, there goes another one who's never going to get off or you know, yep. there's another one we're going to have for a long time because he's going to have trouble. And like those those comments that kind of are said in passing, but really you're like, hmm, you're right. They were all doing that. So, <laughs> you know, those are the kinds of things that we need to stop and think about. Yeah. But definitely. So um, in the sense of looking at case control, so, uh, you know, nurses who are thinking of what they might do, are they more difficult to, to do uh, in terms of just as, as a type of methodology per se? I mean, what's the, what, what's the, is there a specific difficulty with it? Yeah, not, you know, not necessarily, not a difficulty that should stop any of our nursing colleagues from doing um, a case control study. Um, one of the things that um, uh, can maybe facilitate doing it is the identification of the cases. Um, uh, this methodology is particularly useful for cases that are rare. So you don't have to sit around and wait for someone to develop something in order to do your final analysis. You've got the people who have the cases, the disease or the health outcome that you're interested in. And then what, you, what you're doing now is studying retrospectively um, to try to determine if there's association between particular variables, factors, exposures. Um, so the difficulty in that might be that sometimes it's hard to put together your control. Your cases you can define, um, mm -hmm. and then what you need to do is develop a control group, a comparison group of people who don't have that outcome, um, don't have that health issue, um, but they need to be within the same target population. So. Um, there can be some difficulty in defining and recruiting 
um, a population that will function as um, a reliable control for those cases. Mm -hmm. And using the example from the breast cancer uh, study, what would like a control be? Yes, so and the same population of clinical nurses who did not develop breast cancer. Cancer. Okay. All right. That that makes it a little bit clearer. Yeah, um, within a particular, you know, generally within a particular time frame, it's okay. We are going to study clinical nurses within this time frame. You know, the cases you know, are selected because they got, they had breast cancer and the controls are selected because they, um, you know, they, they didn't have the disease outcome, the breast cancer, but generally they come from the same um, population. Okay. And that, yeah. And that to me, that's a great um, example because you, it's, you know, clinical nurses who work shifts with breast cancer versus clinical nurses who work shifts without breast cancer. Correct. Well, that's that's a great example. Um, so in doing this, is in, just in, in winding up a little bit, so uh, now that we have some listeners all excited that they're going to go to case control studies, um, is, there, is there a particular sticky point where people get, you mentioned control sometimes can be the sticky point, but uh, what's, what's kind of like the main thing that people need to keep in mind when they're approaching this? Yeah, really just going back to a, a, um, a well-defined cases. Um, uh, you know, the other, the other example we gave, it was more of a hypothetical example in the article, was um, 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 an understanding of the exposures um, that might have predisposed clinical nurses towards severe cases of COVID. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you were curious about that, it's like, oh, so we're talking about clinical nurses is the population that we're studying. Um, and clinical nurses who um, develop severe cases of COVID. So now, now you got to define what you mean by severe cases. Like, does that mean that they were hospitalized? Does that mean they were intubated? Does that mean they have um, uh, long-term symptoms? So a, a clear mm -hmm. definition um, of that. And then, as we spoke about before, and then trying to figure out um, what is a, a most appropriate control for comparison of those um, nurses who didn't develop severe cases of COVID. So, so be, in, in, as in all research, being as clear and precise as possible in defining your terms and your populations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. That's that's really helpful. And and um, the example you just used, I'm sure people are going to start looking at that uh, yes. as as we speak, if they haven't already. Um, uh, well, thank you so much for uh, taking a, a time to talk a little bit about this. Um, I think in, in reading the articles um, and then now having a conversation with you, it's I, I keep thinking, oh, I wish I had done that research way back when <laughs> when I was a clinical nurse on on looking at people, you know, what what settings what settings did people have more issues than others? And, um, you know, the association, because we know it's not causality. We have to be careful right. about that. But, um, um, you know, back in the day when I was a staff nurse, it, it, we didn't really do research or uh, as staff nurses at all. And now, of course, most institutions, especially if they're magnet, I mean, this is people are doing it all the time. And it's nice to see more um, uh, uh, acute care facilities uh, with nurse researchers as their job, not something they did in addition to something else. So it's, uh, it's I think we've taken a, some major steps forward in um, uh, nursing science and, and being more credible in what we do in the clinical area. Uh, and I think this column is really going to be helpful for people to continue that. So, so thank you. And Alexa, thank you so much for doing this talk. Just so, so listeners know that um, uh, Alexa has been without power for five days because <laughs> five of days. record snowstorms in in uh, in the uh, Sierra Nevadas. And so uh, she's a real uh, committed researcher to get the get the information out there. And we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Just glad there's not a camera. <laughs> <laughs>